Happy Fantastic Friday. Welcome to Simply Remarkable. Now, I am so excited to have as our guest today, Karen McCullough. Now, she's an award-winning, nationally known keynote speaker, and she's the most energetic, positive, inspirational speaker on the circuit today. Now, as an added bonus, this is so exciting. She's fun. <laughs> now, her creative blend of humor, current research, and compelling stories, and even music at times, right, Karen? I love uh, move her audiences to take action. Now, she's been named in the top 30 worldwide speakers in branding for the last four years by Global Gurus. I am so honored to welcome Karen McCullough to us today. Good hey, morning. guys. Hi, Sue. Hey, everybody. Hey, we're so glad to have you. And this is the final Friday of summer. And we're ready to go into fall next, next week. So this is a great time to let you tell us what you, we have coming up in store in the fall for you. So let's kick it off by saying, first of all, you speak on the generations and workplace trends, right? Yes, I do. All right. And you're known as the generational expert. Now, how did you ever choose that topic? Well, um, I started speaking in 2000. So I came from a retail background. Um, I live in Houston and I gradually moved up to having four clothing stores, four kind of preppy clothing stores back in the day. And uh, I hired young people and I worked with young people and I sold to kids going off to college. So I had this, this whole audience, so to speak, of young people. When I started speaking in 2000, I spoke on change. Um, I, I was a change expert, uh, having my own business, being in retail, things changed every three months. So I felt like that was a natural but in 2006, 2007, millennials started coming into the workplace. And I said, I, I understand this generation. Uh, I've been with young people working with them my whole career. I'm going to start speaking on the generations. And that's really how it started. And I'm so glad I did because it's such a rich, rich, and it continually grows um, content area. So I love speaking. I love working with young people. And I like studying young people. And I like how they are affecting the workforce in the workplace. That's amazing. That's amazing. Because today, everybody wants to know about the generations. You know, so it's it's a perfect topic to, to be out there. Now, tell us briefly, what defines a generation? And how many generations are in the workplace now? Well, it, that's, a, that's a great question. If I'm talking to physicians and I'm talking to lawyers, there's five generations. But for most companies, most of my audiences really consist of three to four generations. But um, a generation, if you think about it, it started with a, a category of age. And so the first thing are the dates. Now, I'm not a believer in the dates. I'm a baby boomer, but I really have the comedy and the uh, sarcasm of a Gen X. And I hope I have that interest and curiosity of a millennial. So I believe that for many of us who continually grow, we, we are a combination of the generations. But the best way to define a generation is through their birth dates. So we look at people in these chunks, these years, and we put them mm -hmm. into a generation. But there's more to it than that. When we start to study the generations, we start to look at, number one, events that have happened in those decades, in those years, okay? Um, kind of defining events. And the events that happen both nationally, internationally, and even the social events are kind of like the thread that starts to pull and put the generations together. The differences come with parenting styles. So if we start to look at, I'm a baby boomer, you know, my dad was my way or the highway, you know, follow the rules. I couldn't wait to get out of the house. I'm sure a lot of baby boomers relate to that. But when we start to look at parenting and how the styles have changed, we begin to see that the parent's role has changed. And the parent has gone from that strict enforcer to now a guide, a friend, and a coach. 
So each generation, we start to study their parenting styles. And then we start to look for the technology. You know, we start, we start to see how technology has really changed. And we start to put the, the threads that pull us together, the social events that happen, our parenting style and the technology, we put that into a generation. And we begin to see that we're growing and that we're all evolving and that each generation brings something unique to the table, so to speak. Oh, that sounds great because you're right. I mean, we have to listen to people, don't we? That's that's part of this. Well, now, I think that I think that when we're hiring, we need to ask these questions, you know. So tell me a little bit about your mom and dad. So tell me what their role was because we're gonna get clues by asking these questions. You know, when we get to younger people, we find out how did the pandemic change your life. When we start to look at the things that are happening in the world today and we start to connect those to the generations we begin to get a better picture of the person that we're working with or that we're hiring. That's, that's amazing. That, that gives us a lot of great information so that we can, when we're hiring, you know, learn to be uh, active in that. Now I hear some audience members are calling you the millennial evangelist. Now, how did that come about? So, Let's go back. OK, so I started speaking in 2000. I started speaking on the generations in 2004, 2005. Back then, if we, if we look at Gen X, Gen X was coming on the scene. I'm going to I'm going to go back a little bit before I get to the millennial evangelist. When Gen X came on the scene and they came into the workplace, the baby boomer, think about it. The baby boomer was in their 40s, their 30s and their 40s, and they were in the prime of their career. So when Gen X came on the scene, pretty much we kind of pushed them aside and we baby boomers continually were uh, put into leadership roles and Gen X took a second second seat. I wanted to speak on the Gen X generation, but I'm being really honest, Gen X, I love you. But back then, nobody wanted to hear about it. But it's interesting because when the millennials came into the workplace, and now we're talking about really it happened during when we talk about the Great uh, Recession. Mm -hmm. They started graduating from school in 2008, 2009, and they came into the workplace and there was no work. And so the first thing that happened to millennials was they had to go live with their mom and dad. And so this whole idea of them living in their parents' basement, it really started because there was no work. We were going through the we were going through this uh, recession. I, was, and I don't know if I said resignation or recession, but 2008 was the Great Recession and there was no work. So when they came on the scene, we started to give them a bad rap. And then we started blaming everything that could possibly happen that was negative on millennials. It was their fault. They started being blamed for ending the beer. People stopped drinking as beer and they, millennials were blamed for killing the beer business. Or we started using paper towels instead of napkins and they were blamed for ending the napkin business. I mean, you name it and millennials got blamed for it. So I saw this and I thought, you know, I'm going to study what they do well, and I'm going to study the changes that they're making. And I believe that the millennials have made the greatest changes in the workplace. They've brought about our sensitivity. They've brought about our curiosity about learning about young people. And I believe that all of the cultures that are changing right now with us connecting more to people and the human side of business came from millennials. So when I speak about millennials in my presentation, I talk about the positive things that they've done for the workplace and how they've brought this human centric workplace back. So millennials started calling me the millennial evangelist. I love you millennials. <laughs> and I love them too, because today, who are our people that we deal with the most? Millennials. Well, Gen X, 76% of the CEOs uh, in the world are Gen X. So we better understand Gen X. We better study that generation a little bit more and quit pushing them to the side because it's their innovation. Um, it's, it's their love for work, really, that is leading this workforce today. But millennials are coming into leadership position. I read where I think Deloitte said 45% of leadership roles right now in organizations in the U.S. are millennials. So they're bringing that human side to business um, into the workplace and they're changing the culture. So, uh, yeah, millennials, they're making a difference. And probably, especially in our business, I deal with millennials all the time. So do I.
So do you. <laughs> and I've I've learned and I love it. I really do because it it makes me be that lifelong learner. I want to learn more. Well, now, if you think about if you think about we're both baby boomers and the millennials are the children of baby boomers. So you think about I always blame or praise I, either way you want to look at it, Oprah. Uh, before changing the baby boomer, the baby boomer mom, that working mom, her perspective on raising kids. And so I say Oprah gave us a heart. And so when when millennials were born, the baby boomer mom was getting much more in touch with her connecting to her children. Right. So things started changing. Um, I, I tell a funny part of my bit that when Gen X was a baby, we put them in these things called umbrella strollers. I don't know if any of you remember an umbrella stroller, but they were made out of aluminum and they had like little screws on the end and the little baby's thighs would kind of push into the screw and we would maybe put a Band-Aid on the screw. But we pushed those little Gen X kids around in those strollers because we were busy moms. And then Oprah came on the scene and she said that children, children are our path forward. And moms threw away that umbrella stroller and started buying leather buggies. Remember the beautiful buggies were brought back? And we put the millennial baby into that little buggy. And we said, "You, when you grow up, you could be anything you want to be. And they believed us. <laughs> and they have. And they believed <laughs> us. So there's been a whole shift in mothering and parenting. And I think when we start to look at that, how we raise Gen X kids, and how we raise millennial children, I th think you can get this aha moment. Yeah, we changed, parenting changed, and so did the child. And so I really feel like there's definite clues out there that if we study them, we can begin to understand a generation much more. And that's key. That's key today. Now, we hear a lot about, this is another topic that's really out there about going back to the office versus working at home or being remotely located. That's what I like to say. Um, how do you see the generations playing into this? How, how does that, how's that looking? Well, it's not looking the way you think it's going to look. I think that we, because we know that baby boomers are social and that baby boomers love, they, they've been labeled that they love work and they love going to work. Um, I think we thought with virtual, and this whole idea of the Zoom economy, that the baby boomer was going to be ready to get back into work. Well, guess what? They're not. They love it. They love it. And, and more and more baby boomers want flexibility, and they love this flexibility of working from home and working remotely. Think about it. They've already made their relationships. They've already had their connections with the customer and the client. They can do a great job virtually if, if they understand and learn the technology. That's why we need millennials and Gen Zs to help us. And even my Gen X kids have helped me so much with the technology. But baby boomers love virtual and they don't want to go back to work. Same thing now we start to look at the Gen X. They love their independence. So when we begin to look at the generations, there's not one generation that wants remote more than any other. They Everyone loves it. The problem with remote, the problem with virtual, in, in my opinion, because I am a baby boomer, is I remember working. I learned how the world works from bosses and leaders above me. I learned things that I wouldn't know in my own realm. I, I would be maybe thinking things go one way. But when I would see my boss deal with a situation differently, I began to learn and it began to rub off. My biggest concern with virtual is that the younger you get, and so now we're talking about Gen Z. These are people that are in their uh, mid-20s, maybe 27 down to 21, 22 in the workplace they don't really have a total perception of how world this world of work works. And so when they're at home, unless they have a really good relationship with their boss virtually, I feel like they're not going to get that, that, that help, that structure, those ideas, those different perceptions that, that their boss and, and older generations can give to them. So I think everyone loves virtual except maybe the top boss. You know, we, we've heard where Elon Musk, wants everybody back at work, at work. And so we're starting to hear um, Jamie Diamond uh, with JP Morgan Chase wants his people back at work. I think there's some businesses, especially in sales 
and in marketing where you need that energy of the team to keep you going, that energy of the team to help you boost your sales. And I feel like that piece is missing with virtual. So when you say who loves virtual, I think everybody, everybody likes the convenience of virtual, but I'm not sure, you know, I, I can't say because really we'll, we'll know in the next four to five years if it's really helping or hurting people. Right. But we do know virtual is here to stay <laughs> for now. So as baby boomers and anyone else, the technology is out there and we just have to learn it. Well, virtual know. virtual hybrid right now is here to stay for, for most people. And as speakers, you know, we have to understand and embrace virtual because there's so many benefits to it. You can pull a team, a national and international team together with, with a call with a, a Microsoft Teams or a, a Zoom call. And so there's so many benefits to it. But we're human beings. And I want to say that again. We are human. And as humans, we need to connect. And so I think that as this progresses, organizations are going to find meaningful ways to bring their team together and their people together. We need that connection, even even if we're like eh, not crazy about my workmates. Right. I think that when we see them, when we haven't seen them for months, there is definitely a connection. And we as human beings need to connect. It, it's part of our process of creativity, of innovation. And also it just it stimulates um, a need for others that I feel like face-to-face -face really does um, help with. I, I certainly agree on that. And then there's another topic that keeps now taking over uh, everywhere you look. And I know you have some really great information to share with us on this, but tell us what is all this about the concept of quiet quitting. Quiet quitting. I, I, knew that, <laughs> I knew that this was coming. I knew that this was coming. So, you know, Gen Z, I love you, Gen Z. Now, Gen Generation Z, like I said before, these are people that are in their 20s. Uh, and it goes all the way down to 10-year-olds. So when we talk about the generations, I think right now with the technology the way it is, and the world evolving so quickly and changing. I think that we can't look at an age and say, oh my God, these 27 year olds are gonna be just like these 10 year olds when they get into the workplace or the 10 year olds are gonna be like the 27 year olds. I believe that there's going to be new ideas and new concepts that are going to be created. And right now, right now, people that are in the workplace that are in their early twenties and their mid twenties have come up with a term called quiet quitting. And if you think about it, I mean, I'm going to define quiet quitting and it's, I think it has a kind of a negative connotation because quiet quitting is doing ex only what is expected of you at work and nothing more. Kind of like the bare minimum to get by. But there's other ways that people are looking at quiet quitting, like I'm not going to take on an extra project. If you want me on another committee and it's not really in my job description, I would like to be compensated for this. So there's this whole idea of work and compensation that has gone into this whole idea of quiet quitting. People really aren't quitting quietly, but they are quitting this uh, culture, this, we call it the hustle culture, um, working more to get ahead. So many younger people want work-life balance. And to me, Gen X came on the scene and started talking about work-life balance back in the 90s. People didn't want to hear about it. You know, back in 2001, nobody wanted to hear it because the baby boomer was all about work and more work and, and doing that extra with the hustle culture. But right now, this generation is looking at work-life balance in a different way. Um, they're really calling it work-life imbalance. And if you think about why, maybe it's from virtual, you know, when, when we think about virtual work, we think about boundaries and we, we realize that with a text message, you can just text somebody any hour, night or day, and you can ask them to work on a project. So the boundaries of work, you know, that nine to five are now blurred and they're now blurred. A lot of it is because of the phone and a lot of it is because of virtual. Younger people are now looking at this and they're saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm only going to work the hours of work nine to five, I'm going to shut my computer down at five and I'm going to, I'm going to stop. So I'm not going to have these blurred lines and they're calling it quiet quitting. So quiet quitting is doing the bare minimum 
you know, not going over and above um, unless you're compensated for it. So it's, it's a trend, but you know what, if you think about it, quiet quitting has been going on forever. I mean, people have been quiet quitting uh, from the time of work, the onset of work, they just didn't talk about it. People were kind of under the radar, so to speak. So right now, this generation, Gen Z, has brought this whole concept right to the forefront. And they've done it using Twitter and they've done it using TikTok. So social media, think about it. it it's just a web that can get a concept out there immediately. And so a few weeks ago or a few months ago, quiet quitting was born. Wow. And you're right. We see it everywhere. So in your opinion, though, when you look at the whole picture here, what do you think? Because when managers and CEOs and all are seeing this, what do you think is a solution to this? What what is it going to take to kind of get this, you know, uh, and I'd say in line or say, how do we handle it? What do we do? What do you think is a solution? Well, I think I think now it's being brought to the forefront. OK, so um, interestingly enough, I, I live in an area where there are a lot of young people around me and I have uh, new neighbors that just moved in and both of them are in the consulting business and they're both millennials and they're working 24 seven. Um, my neighbor came out, Dina came out the other day and she started talking to me about being up at four in the morning to get her work done because they have kids and she had to get her project done. And she worked from four in the morning, worked with other kids for a bit and then worked until nine o'clock at night. She told me she was exhausted and she was burned out. So we're hearing a lot of this whole idea of overwork and being burned out. So there is definitely with virtual uh, work, people are working longer. And the boundaries between your personal life and your work life can be blurred. And what we're starting to see is this whole idea uh, where people are really thinking about their mental health. They're thinking about their stress levels. And so work and your personal life with, with this whole virtual world has become a little bit of a conflict, so to speak. So I think that it's a two-sided coin. I think on one side, we are looking at, yeah, you know, I can't do this. I'm not going to be working so much overtime. I need a personal life. And the other side of the coin, we have to begin to see leadership and management realizing this and starting to value people, starting to be very aware that we're pushing too hard and begin to look at that every person that works for us definitely wants to be valued. They want to be respected. They want to be appreciated. And they also want to be acknowledged when they're doing extra and going above and beyond. So this whole idea, starting with my millennials, of bringing this human side of work, this human-centric piece into the workplace, I believe is where we are. So yeah, it's a two-way street. People are going to have to create boundaries, but we're also going to have to have a much more sensitive management where people begin to respect and understand the individual at work. So in the end, I believe that it will bring good. It, it, we're, we're continually changing the culture of work. Um, but this whole idea right now is I'm quiet quitting. I, I, I think that it can be also a negative factor. So we, we have to look at it with, with a more uh, open, open perspective. Right. And I think that's with everything, you know, when, like we said before, the millennials coming and, you know, what they, that concept was, well, this is another concept. So we're looking. So the future of the workplace culture is at stake here, right? I mean, you know, it's a change. It's a, a different. And there's lots of um, information out there about culture, workplace culture. And there's so many different things. So. I think it's opened a lot of at least people talking about it. Well, we have the dialogue, right? We have this conversation going. And if you get on LinkedIn and you just type in quiet quitting, you're going to see so many opinions. I think it's healthy. I think it's good. The workplace is changing. Number one, the world is changing. Number two, technology is changing. But number three, people are changing. People are evolving. And with this, people have a voice. And this younger generation certainly has a voice. If we think about it through history and time, we say maybe it started with number one, parenting, parenting, giving them that voice, making, helping them make decisions and then being verbal. But also this idea of social media, you can get a concept or an idea like quiet quitting 
it's out there. And once it's out there, it, it, it's kind of like wildfire and it grows. So where, where will the workplace be? It will be better. We are bringing in again, the human centric side to work, but it will be different. I can't determine, I can't predict, none of us can predict if virtual is, is here to stay, if hybrid is going to work. I think the jury's out and we are all in this messy kind of uncertain place of change. And I think that people should be more open. They should be reading more and we should be asking questions and learning from other generations under trying to understand Gen Z rather than judging them. Curiosity, questioning, dialogue. These are all important pieces, I think, to growing a culture. Right. And I think the creativity that's coming that I see through it, you know, it makes it then you want, you love to be working that way. You want to have fun and energy and all like that. And that, I think it can stimulate that. I really do. I, you know, so you're looking at the whole picture of the, the culture. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, I think it's opened our, I think we're thinking more. We're yeah. starting to look back. It's interesting for me because I'm talking so much to people about what do you think of quiet quitting and what I'm hearing from a lot of baby boomers. Uh, they're talking about the work that they did, that they were not, they weren't compensated for, that they weren't appreciated for. People are kind of going back and looking at the way things were and they're saying, yeah, things do need to change. Right. And I think that leadership is looking at things in a different way. I think the role of manager right now has become much more robust. And I think that we're going to have to do more training, teaching our managers how to connect and really relate to the people that they're managing rather than just pushing through the work. I agree with that. I agree with that totally. Now, in closing, I can't believe 30 minutes goes by so quick. I can't either because we can talk about I'm like, Okay. All right. But my final question for you today is, what will you do today to be remarkable? Well, I am here with my my daughter, my son-in-law, and my two grandsons who are both, uh, one is in fourth grade and one is in first grade. So I'm going to have a remarkable day, probably with the Legos that are around here. So I will be doing some creative work today and some creative building. So um, I've got a full weekend ahead, lots of cooking. We're going to be making pizzas and meatballs and we're going to be playing with Legos. So I have a creative weekend coming. Wow. And, be learning about Gen Z and a little bit about maybe Gen Alpha, Gen Alpha. So we'll see. So I'll have right. much more information. All right. Maybe we all need to join her. She's in Washington, D.C. So we'll just come on up and have some of that cooking. That sounds great. Well, now, in closing out there to my audience, I want to ask you the same question. What will you do today? to be remarkable. I'd love for you to send us those answers and any chats of anything you want us to answer. We'd love to hear that. Also, next week, we're excited to have with us a special guest as well. It's Dennis Baltimore, and he is going to bring us information and tips and all on mindful thinking and the mindset. So you won't want to miss it. And we just thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Karen, for being with us today. And we wish for you a remarkable weekend. Here's to you with your tea or coffee. And this is the last weekend of summer, but it's still going to be warm. So we're, we're not giving it up yet. So have a remarkable weekend, everyone.